Good morning, kids. It's good to have you with us this Saturday morning. We always look forward to having you with us. Um, we love having the kids be part of our live broadcast. So if you have kids or grandkids that you want to be a part of our live broadcast, um, you can just send an email to awakeflorida at gmail.com and we will make sure that you have the link um, so that they can be part of our live broadcast. Um, if they don't want to be part of the live broadcast, you can always tune in through our Facebook or YouTube channels. So we're going to go ahead and get started. As always, we start with a little bit of praise and worship. So I'm going to pull that up um, right now and we'll go ahead and get started. a good song and it is a reminder to us that Jesus is our king. So I'm going to turn things over to Miss Stephanie now so that um, she can start our lesson for this morning. Good morning, Life Kids. How are you today? Well, that was a beautiful song that reminded us all across the world, all across the land, Jesus is our true king. Now, today's lesson, we're going to discuss someone that thought he was the true king. The people of Israel wanted a king. They knew about God, but they didn't want God. They want a man in the form of a king. We're talking about the children of Israel. And we will learn about the first king, the King Saul. But we'll find out some very interesting things about that in the coming weeks also to see what God does about the first king and then the next kings and the next kings. All right. Well, we're going to tune into our lesson now about King Saul, the first king. And today, I'm going to tell you the story of Saul. Are you ready? Yes, Father, we are. Saul was anointed as the king at a very critical moment in the history of Israel. Philistines were very powerful, and they were taking away the land that God had promised Israelites. 
the very existence of Israel was threatened. Israel, listen, it is God who speaks. I shall anoint a king for you. But remember this, he shall make the mighty men among you as his soldiers and servants, and your daughters will be his wives and maids. He will take over your land. He will reduce you to slavery. There will be no point in seeking help from God after this. What do you say? We don't worry about that, but today we want a king. Yes, what we need is a king. All right then, you shall have a king within 30 days from today. Gather all the Israelites at Mizpah on that day. In the hill country of Judea, there was a little town called Gaibe. In that town lived a man named Kish who belonged to the tribe of Benjamin. One day, some of his donkeys got lost. He sent his son, Saul, along with a servant in search of the donkeys. This happened a few days after Samuel promised the Israelites that he would give them a king. <sighs> I am tired. Let's search for some more time. Master, forget the donkeys. Let's return back home. They must be worried thinking about us. Won't it be a shame to return empty-handed? I've heard that there is a prophet around here. Let's go and talk to him. Yes, master. Come, maybe he can help us in finding the donkeys. Hey, look, there's someone there. Let's go and ask him. Hey, hello, sir. Yes, how can I help you? Sir, we heard that there is a prophet around here. Do you know him? Oh, did you mean the prophet Samuel? Yes. He is in town. You may find him on top of this mountain. Thank you, sir. Come, let's get to the top of this mountain. Have we reached, Master? <sighs> yes, we have reached the top. Oh, there's someone over there. Let's go and ask him. Excuse me, sir. Yes? Could you please help us find Prophet Samuel? We are coming from Gaibe. I am Samuel. Did you? Did you just say that you are coming from Gaibe? Yes, we are from Gaibe. And is your name Saul? Whoa, yes, my name is Saul. But how did you know? God, it's like you told me in my vision. Thank you, God. Master, we come in search for our donkeys. They were lost a few days back. Don't worry about the donkeys anymore. They have been found. Come with me. You can stay with me tonight. Yes, Master. Samuel had a vision about Saul the night before. And when he saw Saul, he knew that he was the chosen one by God to be the king of Israel. Saul stayed with Samuel that night and they were about to return back home the next morning. Saul? Saul, wait there. Yes, Master? Saul, I want to show you something. Tell your servant to go on without us. You go ahead. I'll join you in some time. What is it, Master? Why did you want me to stay? Kneel down, Saul. Yes, Master. Saul, God has anointed you to be the king of Israel. You will save God's people from their enemies. Master, I, I don't think I'm worthy. 
I come from a humble family. It doesn't matter. You will know it's true because on your way, you will find three men. Huh? One of them will be carrying three lambs. The second will be carrying three loaves of bread. And the third will be carrying a wineskin with him. And as you reach Mount Gaide, the prophets will come out playing music and they will be chanting. The Spirit of the Lord will seize you at that moment. What? What am I supposed to do then? Don't worry. Do what you may at that moment. Like Samuel had foretold, Saul met with the men on his way. And when he reached Mount Gaibe, he saw the prophets coming down chanting and playing music. Ah, it's just like he told me. And now the prophets too. When Saul saw the prophets, the Spirit of the Lord came over him and he was transformed into a new man. Hallelujah! 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 Hey! Hey, isn't he the son of Kish? Yes, he is. But what happened to him? I think the Spirit of Lord has come over him. Is Paul one of the prophets too? Looks like he's one too. Hallelujah! The people of Israel gathered at Mount Mizbah as Samuel had directed them. They were waiting eagerly to meet their new king. People of Israel, you have elected Saul, son of Kish from the tribe of Benjamin as your king. Saul, son of Kish, long live the king, long live the king. Saul, God has chosen you to protect Israelites from the enemy. You should always remember to be just and kind and be like a father to them. I will, Master. You should also care for the poor. And you should not accumulate wealth. Do not build palaces for your own use. I will never forget your words, Master. I will never forget what you have done for me. Thank you so much. Okay, boys and girls. So that is the story of King Saul. Um, Saul was anointed by Samuel. The people of Israel, they wanted a king. They chose not to listen to the one true king of kings and Lord of lords. They wanted a fleshly king, someone that they can see. But remember, there were going to be some consequences that the children of Israel would have to face because they chose a king instead of listening to the one king. King of kings and Lord of lords. Remember the song that says all across the world, all across the land, Jesus is the king. So one of the things that they were going to have to deal with that the king Saul was going to turn them into soldiers and their wives were going to have to be servants and they would have to do exactly what King Saul said. Also, he was going to make them into slavery. Now, that's not pleasing unto God, but the Lord is going to honor their request and give them a king. So Samuel came and anointed Saul as the first king. Now, I have a scripture for that also concerning kings and those that are in authority. I'm going to read that scripture to you. One of them is Revelations chapter 17, verse 14. 
It says, they will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumphant over them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. So it is better to follow God as our one true, true king, because he will honor those that he has chosen, and he will honor those who follow him. Another scripture that comes to mind while I'm thinking about this is 2 Timothy. Let's see if I can pull that up real quick. It is 1 Timothy 2 and 2. It said to pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that we may live a peaceful and quiet life marked by godliness and dignity. So the Bible tells us that we are to pray for those in authority, for kings, for presidents, for governors. We are to pray for those in authority. So that means that the children of Israel, they wanted a king and God gave them Saul. So they should pray for him and pray that God changes his heart. So remember that boys and girls, even though we have leadership, we need to pray for everyone in authority. And remember our first king that God had appoint, well, not God appointed, but was given to the children of Israel. His name was King Saul. All right, and next week we're going to talk a little bit more about the next king. We're going to talk about King David, and that will be coming from Miss Carmen, Carmen and Sarah's mom. So, all right, boys and girls, thank you and have a great and blessed day. Continue to have fun learning about God. Blessings. All right. Thank you, Miss Stephanie, um, for that lesson. And Pastor Mac um, posted a message here in our comments that says, pray for me too. So yes, we want to pray for our presidents, our governors, all of our leaders and our pastors who are also um, over us in our lives and our apostle, Apostle Joshua and his family. So um, we're going to go ahead with and continue on um, with our program, and I'm going to call up Mama Pauline, who is going to do our story time. Oh, good morning, children. It's always so good to be a part of this on Saturday mornings with you. Yes, so the people wanted the king, but that king is not necessarily going to be perfect like God is perfect. So he's going to have some faults. So sometimes there were good kings, and sometimes there were bad kings. So we learn that Saul was the first king and that maybe he got a little bit proud of being king. Sometimes kings can be so wrapped up in themselves that they forget about the people that they're supposed to be taking care of. Today's story is called Mustache by Mac Barnett. Duncan was a terrible king, but he was terribly handsome. Don't I look wonderful, said King Duncan. Yes, sire, said his royal advisor. He spent every royal day admiring his royal reflection and not doing much else, which is why his kingdom was a royal mess. Look what he does. He puts signs up everywhere all about him. King Duncan didn't repair the roads. He built billboards instead, billboards all about himself. He didn't fix the playground. He put up a statue instead, a statue about himself. 
This kind of stuff made King Duncan's subjects furious. So one day, his subjects stormed his castle. We need roads. We need swings. Do something for us, King Duncan, they shouted. They had signs protesting. For you, said the king. Yes, said the little girl. The king was quiet. Come back in a week, he said. Gentle subjects, he said seven days later. You have asked me to repair the roads and the playgrounds. I have done something even better. Behold, my gift for you. The crowd was silent. What was his gift? A big banner about him saying he's so great. That's it, said the little girl. Yes, said the king. Oh, the king grinned. So the children and everybody thought that was the only gift he was giving was a big banner of himself. The crowd left, the sun set. And the next morning, the king's gift looked like this. <gasps> Somebody had painted a big mustache on his big banner that says he's so great. King Duncan was furious. I must catch this vandal, he screamed. Yes, sire, said his royal advisor. And put him in jail, screamed the king. Yes, sire, said his advisor. Or her, or her in jail, said the king. So King Duncan had his royal advisor nail posters to every royal in the kingdom. Posters said, wanted, ever drew the mustache on this terrific banner that says he was great, a reward would be offered. King Duncan soaked in his royal hot tub and waited for someone to turn in the culprit. It should be any minute now, said the king. Yes, sire, said his royal advisor. But overnight, something happened. <gasps> Look what happened. They drew mustaches all over his wanted posters. King Duncan was outraged. And he went out for a walk. Look, mustaches were everywhere on his signs and in the park. They put it on his statue. He went to the park. This didn't help. <gasps> so he slouched in his royal throne. Look at my wonderful face, he said. How could they be doing this to me? I don't know, sire, his royal advisor replied. Except his royal advisor did know. Every night the old man had been sneaking out of the castle and painting mustaches on the pictures of the king. And he wasn't the only one. So had she... So had he, so had she, so had they. In fact, just about the only person who hadn't painted a mustache on a picture of the king was this guy. Oh, never mind. He ended up painting one as well. There were mustaches everywhere. The king was having a hard time dealing with it all. One night, he lay awake in his royal waterbed. I know what I'll do, he thought. I'll trick the culprit into revealing himself or herself, he added five minutes, seconds later. The next day, he called out his subjects to his royal castle. My gentle subjects, he said, you have been playing a joke on me. And I have found this joke hilarious. So with the person who's been drawing mustaches on my picture, would just raise his or her hand. We can all laugh and there will be no punishment. So look what happened. Everybody raised their hand. You're all going to jail, screamed the king. All of us, asked the little girl. All of you, screamed the king. Oh, but the jail wasn't big enough to hold him. Not even close. So the king made the jail bigger and bigger and bigger until it could hold everybody. But that's something interesting because he built a brand new jail, which was better than what his city was. And every day the king sat on his royal throne, the only free man in all the land, 
We sure showed them, King Duncan said to his reflection. His reflection was silent. His reflection, though handsome, was not very good company. Day after day, the king listened to the sound of laughter nearby, of donkey carts rolling down freshly paved roads and swings creaking in parks. Things seemed to be going well out there in the jail because he built everything new out there, right? He slumped, he sighed, he felt a little alone. Until one morning, the king sat up straight, he got off his royal throne, he stood in front of his royal mirror, he reached for his royal paintbrush, and he painted a mustache on his royal face. It looked pretty good. Well, that's it, children. See, sometimes we get so caught up in thinking that we're so very important that we're forgetting about taking care of the people that we were supposed to take care of. If you're a king, a president, a governor, just as Miss Stephanie said, or as Pastor Mac mentioned, we need to pray for those people who are in authority over us so that they will treat us right and they will govern us properly and take care of us if that's what they're supposed to do. So I thank you children for joining us and I turn it back to Megan and understand that King Saul, although he was the first king, he's not gonna be the only king. And the difference is that Jesus is our king and he's the one that governs us and protects us. Back to you, Meg. Okay, thank you, Mama Pauline, for that story. Um, and thank you, Miss Stephanie, for our lesson for our younger kids. So we're going to go ahead and do the second part of our lesson, which is geared more towards our older kids. Um, we are still going to be talking about Saul, the first king. Um, so I'm going to be backing it up and talking about the same things Miss Stephanie shared, but we're just going to go a little bit deeper into the story of Saul. Um, and how he became king. So um, what we're covering right now, uh, you know, as you know, we're going through the, through the Bible. Um, we started at the beginning, and right now we are in the book of 1 Samuel. So um, there's a 1 Samuel and a 2 Samuel, and we are in the first book of Samuel, and we are going to be covering um, chapters 7 through 13. And so um, remember last week I had shared with you how the Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant. And the reason that they were able to steal it is because the Israelites foolishly moved the Ark of the Covenant from its place where the people came to worship and offer their offerings. And they took it into the camp of the soldiers. And so the Philistines were able to steal the Ark. But when they stole the ark, bad things started to happen to them because they weren't supposed to have it. So they started getting sick. And because of this, they decided they shouldn't keep the ark. So they loaded it up on an ox cart and sent it back into Israel. And so when the ox cart gets into the land of Israel, all of Israel rejoices because the presence of God has returned because the ark has returned. But what they do is they leave it in that place um, where it entered Israel. They still don't take it back to the holy place. And we're going to get back to that later, later, later um, as we go through the Bible. But um, so um, we're going to go back to Samuel. So remember we talked about Samuel. Um, Samuel was raised in in that holy place by Eli, who was the priest at the time. And so when Eli became old and he, he died, um, Samuel took over as priest. Now Samuel was also a prophet. Remember, we talked about that last week, how God spoke to Samuel and Samuel then told the people um, what God had said. So he was a prophet and a priest. But he was also a judge. Remember, we talked about the judges, how 
Israel, even though the nations around them had a king, Israel did not have a king. They had judges, people that God appointed to be um, rule, rulers, but they basically brought justice to Israel. It isn't the same thing as a king. Um, you can think of it like a judge in a court where um, when wrong things happen, they make a judgment as to what is good and right and what is not. So Samuel was a priest, a prophet, but he was also a judge. And so um, we're going to go ahead into, um, sorry, as we go into 1 Samuel chapter 8, um, we're at a point in time where Samuel is now an old man and he has several sons who he then appoints because he's a judge. He appoints his sons to also be judges. But unfortunately, his sons did not follow in the way that he did. Remember, Eli had that problem too. Eli was a priest and he set his sons to help him in his duties as a priest and to serve in the uh, area of the holy place. And they took advantage of their position and mistreated the people. Unfortunately, Samuel's sons did the same thing. They started taking bribes and they were not good to the people of Israel. And so in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, it says that the people came to Samuel and they said, you are old and your sons do not follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. Give us a king to lead us. So remember, when God gave the Israelites the promised land, he said, I don't want you to follow off after the ways of the other people. I don't want you to make their gods your gods. And so he commanded the Israelites to push out the other nations so that they would not be living among them and influencing their decisions. So here's another way that we see how the nations around them influenced Israel. They didn't have a king, but the nations around them did. And they decided that that was a better way. And so they said, Samuel, they told Samuel, we want a king. So Samuel prayed to God in verses seven through nine. It says, listen, uh, this is how God responded to Samuel. It says, listen to all the people, uh, Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. So as the video had showed and Miss Stephanie shared, there were consequences for them rejecting God as their king, because in reality, they already had a king. They had God as their king. And all they had to do was follow the rules that God had given to them through Moses, the prophet, but they didn't, they didn't do it and they kept struggling and struggling. And so they decided that they wanted a man. Just like when God spoke to them, they said, whoa, they became afraid and they said, okay, God, we don't want you to speak to us directly. We want you to speak to us through Moses. So now they're saying, God, you, you, we don't want you to be king over us directly. We want you to appoint a king who is a man over us. And so Samuel went to the people and he warned them um, that this king is going to basically make you his servants and he's going to charge you taxes. So right now, everything that you have is yours and you can till your ground and, um, you know, God asks for an offering, 
but everything else is yours. So now they still have to give offerings to the Lord, but now they also have to pay taxes to the king. And so he tells them that they are going to regret their decision, but they respond saying, we want a king over us, so we will be like other nations. Well, God did not want them to be like other nations. God wanted them to be the special nation that he declared them to be. But God listens to them and he agrees to give them a king. And in 1 Samuel chapter 9, we find out that um, a man named Saul, he loses three donkeys as the video showed when he goes to find them and he can't find them. He goes to the prophet in hopes that Samuel will be able to tell them where he is. But God speaks to Samuel ahead of time and says, I'm sending somebody to you and he's the one you're going to anoint as king. And so um, as Saul approaches him, um, Samuel hears from the Lord, this is the man. And so he tells Saul, I'm going to make you king over everyone. And Saul says, but I'm the least of my tribe. Why, why would you do this? So remember that Moses said the same thing when God chose him. He said, I am the least. But it doesn't really matter what we think of ourselves, does it? It only matters what God sees in us. And we have to always remember to obey what he's telling us. So Samuel explains in great detail um, to Saul what is going to happen to him next. And the reason why he does, he does this is because he wants to prove to Saul that God is going to do what he said. And we saw that in the video that um, Saul met, went and met the prophets. He was able to prophesy and all the things that happened as happened as God said. And so he tells Saul that when he goes to Gilgal, he's to wait seven days for Samuel to meet him. And then we go into first Samuel chapter 10, where um, Samuel is addressing the people. And he says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have now rejected your God who saves you out of all of your disasters and calamities. And you have said, no, appoint a king over us. So now pre present yourselves before the Lord by your tribe and clan. So remember, Israel is made up of 12 tribes. They were, the, the names of those tribes are from the 12 sons of Israel. Israel or Jacob. So they come together as this giant group tribe, but in within those tribes are families or what they called clans. And so God um, basically down selects each of the tribes and he goes to the tribe of, of Benjamin. And then he goes to the family that is Saul's family and he gets all the way down to where God selects Saul to be the king. And he does this in front of all the people of Israel. But when they go and they name Saul as the king, Saul is nowhere to be found. Because he's hiding. He was afraid. You know, he keeps, he said, I'm the least of these. Why have you chosen me? So he's afraid to be king. So he goes and he hides. But you know that you can't hide from God. And so God reveals to the people where Saul is hiding. And they do anoint him as the king. So God then speaks to the people in 1 Samuel 11, chapter 12. And he reminds them that they said, no, we want a king to rule over us, even though the Lord your God was your king. And in verses 14 through 15, it says, Samuel said to the people, 
if you fear the Lord and serve and obey him and do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, good. But if you do not obey the Lord and if you rebel against his commands, his hand will be against you as it was against your ancestors. So God's giving them another warning that, yeah, now you have a king, but you still have to obey God. And as long as you and the king obey and follow God, that God will be with you. So the Israelites, after hearing this from Samuel, are, are grieved and they're sorry for what they've done. And they ask Samuel to pray for them. And Samuel says in verse 22, for the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. So God then tells them again that they are his people and that he will have mercy on them despite what they have done. So we go into 1 Samuel 13 now. Saul is the king and the Philistines are preparing to fight Israel. So Saul tells the people to meet him in Gilgal. And Saul remains in Gilgal waiting for Samuel. Remember, Samuel said, when you go to Gilgal, wait seven days. So Saul remained in Gilgal waiting for Samuel, but the people started to become afraid and they started to scatter. So Saul starts to get nervous and he's like, I can't go into battle unless we've offered a sacrifice and the people are leaving. I need to do something. So Saul acts in his own power and he offers the sacrifice. He makes the offering to God instead of the priest. Saul is not the priest. Saul is the king. And God was very specific um, in the beginning when he said about the rules that there were certain offerings that were only to be given by the priest but Saul took it into his own hands and made the offering himself. And as soon as he was finished making the offering, Samuel showed up as he promised. But he realized what Saul had done and Saul was very angry. And in verse 13 and 14, it says, you have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God gave you. If you had, you would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's command. So just like God said, Saul did not obey God, and so God was going to appoint another king. And so we'll find out in the weeks to come what happens between Saul and the next king in line to take over and how this one act of disobedience that Saul has actually changes his whole life. So... Um, it was so good to have you with us this morning. We thank you for joining us and we ask that you would continue to join us. We are going to continue to meet on Saturday mornings at 11 a.m. Um, to continue God's time. And then for those who are able to join us in service on Sunday, um, we are going to start taking the kids out and doing a craft with them that will join in and um, with the lesson from the day before. So we encourage you to, even if you can't be on at 11, that you come back and check in and listen to the message so that when you are able to do that project, you're aware of what the lesson is about. And so um, I announced 
um, a couple of weeks ago and again last week that we were going to get the kids together um, next Saturday. Unfortunately, um, things did not work out as we had planned. And so we're going to have to postpone that get together. And so we will give you that information when we have it available. But um, for now, just plan on meeting us online as usual at 11 a.m. next Saturday, um, June 12th. And we look forward to seeing you then. Bye.